thank you very much, Pankaj, uh, and thank you very much for organizing this. It's greatly appreciated the effort you go through on our behalf every year. This year I'm going to talk about a work in progress, and that is about a series of metallic assays I've done for coins. It is on an Indian series. I apologize to, to all of those of you who have other interests, but I think actually that the observations you're going to find are generally applicable uh, across ancient and medieval numismatics, so hopefully it's of interest to a wider group. And it made it disappear. So how do we progress from one to the next? Which button have we pushed? Uh, the right arrow. Okay. What we saw in the previous two speakers, of course, is arranging series of coins into meaningful uh, series that tell us something. Uh, you saw that with Sasha. Uh, Bilal also had the same thing. It's a basic technique that all of us use all the time when we're dealing with more than single coins. And of course, the first thing we turn to is motifs, as Sasha did. Uh, the legends themselves, the motifs can be visual. And it's possible, as was done with the mug coins, the Bukada coins, to structure a series on the basis of their appearance. The legends, uh, obviously, are the main one that we use in Islamic numismatics, in classical numismatics. The fabric, you saw uh, some reference to that by uh, Sasha, and that is the question of uh, progression. Is there a progression from uh, a finer appearance to a cruder appearance is a progression of wide to narrow. Uh, how the coin looks uh, can be a very significant indicator of where it sits in a series, of course. The metrology uh, goes without uh, saying. In every series, we tend to weigh them and we notice that there are trends. And quite often, the trend of metrology is very consistent with the trend that we've noticed in the fabric, etc which reinforces our sense of confidence in the series that we're making. The most difficult of all has been precious metal content, and largely because it has historically been very difficult to test coins. It hasn't been done, especially in the 19th century, until very recently, very much. Uh, we have in the audience one of our uh, uh, members who uh, very much used in the 1960s and 70s, uh, I think, in association with uh, Adon Gordas at Michigan, uh, early techniques, early modern techniques to try and determine what would be uh, metal content of coins. But as an indicator of a series and a progression, it has been much less used. Um, the series where the metal content has been very important, uh, we know the Romans. In the second and third centuries, there's been endless literature about how uh, the coins got more and more debased, how they were silver washed, and debates about that as to whether it was intentional or non-intentional, and it was seen as an indication of imperial monetary <coughs> policy. Another one in my field where you see this uh, classically was in Indo-Greek, leading to the Shaka, leading to the Padava. At the start of it you had uh, virtually pure silver in Bactria, when you followed it down into India and through the successive dynasties, at the end, you have Gandafari's coins, which are almost pure copper. So we took this to mean a series of debasements over time, and that helped us to reinforce the sequencing of otherwise very difficult to sequence series. One of the most important of all, in my view, uh, was in the Sasania. This is a series of coins which we uh, have in India. It's the backbone of medieval Indian numismatics, at least in the north and the west. And it was a series of coins that was issued for 800 years. I have here a sequence of them. And you see that the initial coin was uh, a, an actual Sasanian coin of the Emperor of Firuz. Uh, extremely thin, extremely broad, extremely high sewer content. The, uh, the higher relief is such that you actually get a difficulty in the reverse in the manufacturing process where quite often um, there, there is a cavity where 
you have an obverse uh, high relief uh, king crown on reverse fire altar attendants uh, Pahlavi, the uh, mint name the date and once this was adopted and I'm not going to go into how that came about in India you see immediately that some of the details were uh, stripped away. The Pallavi is becoming formulaic. Um, all of the features are becoming less uncertain, although you see the same cavity on the reverse, so it is a broad, thin coin created by the same method of striking. Uh, as a little later on, we think by the uh, 7th century, uh, they're getting flat. Uh, no longer do you have the uh, reverse cavity. The Pallavi has become uh, simply a series of lines. In other words, all the original message has been stripped away and all you have is a face and attendance with fire altars. Progressively, uh, it has been decided that this was the succession <laughs> Uh, you can see that as time goes on, the coins get narrower, they get thicker. Um, the successive generations of die cutters don't quite understand what they were seeing. So now, for example, the crown is becoming a little more integrated into the head itself. Uh, you start seeing very typical things like a diamond in the middle of the fire altar. And finally, a star emerges in the, in the fire altar. And the rest of the details are getting difficult to follow. Finally, ultimately, uh, towards the end of the series, they're very thick. Uh, as time goes on, they get thicker and thicker and narrower and narrower. And you can see that the whole idea of a crown has been lost whatsoever. The crown has been integrated into the head. You have these bizarrely long heads. The reverse, you still see the star, but it's quite obvious that the meaning of all of this has been lost. Any observer seeing this coin would not know that you had their attendance on each side of a fire altar. And here's the end of the series. Uh, you have extremely thick pellet-like coin. You can barely make out any of the uh, features. The star is still there. Elements of the head. This is a sequence that has been worked out over 120 years by a great number of people and they have used hordes to help them to segregate different aspects of it. And I've put together the entire series, which you would never see in a hoard. The question is, is the sequencing correct? Visually, by all, most of the criteria that we've been seeing to date, it seems reasonable. But can it be proven as well by uh, the metal content? Is there, in fact, a pattern in the silver content of these coins that indicates that there was a debasement which is commensurate with the evolution of the fabric. This question was taken on by our colleague Kamal Maheshwari of Mumbai. Uh, over 20 years he did a massive study of these indo sasanian coins. In 2010 he published it and while he actually gave thousands of examples in his book, he managed to get several hundred of them tested, and they were tested according to a very rigorous methodology in the Birla Institute of Archaeology in Hyderabad. Um, the system was AAS, Atomic Absorption Spectral <coughs> Photometry. I don't pretend to know anything about it. But from his own book, he says that basically what they did was they abraded they filed down the side of each coin until they got to bare metal. They then used a, a, a tiny uh, drill to take a sample out of the core of the edge. This they would dissolve, and using the AAS system, they would determine what were the constituents of it. <coughs> so he did this for, uh, as I say, several hundred. What were his findings? Well, uh, as not unexpected over that long series, the indo sasanian coins vary from a high of 99% down to 1%. Some of them were virtually pure, pure copper. In general, the early and thin coins that we saw were high silver content. 
In general, the leanest and thickest ones, the pellet-like ones that you saw, were very poor silver, if not copper. However, if you stop at any point along that continuum and choose a type and follow his figures, you don't have a consistent pattern. For any given type along that continuum, there seems to be a very broad variation in silver content. There was not a typical silver content at any point in time. And that made it very difficult to say that you were proving that there was a debasement over time that was commensurate with your other forms of organization. So I'm looking at the series and trying to determine how accurate his typology is. And I'm wondering, can we do more specimens? Can we zero in on areas where there was a blank using XRF? The X-ray uh, fluorescence is uh, a very uh, emerging and available tool. Even uh, jewelers are using it around the world. It simply is a surface scan. Um, I got uh, about 100 coins uh, tested by XRF at the Geological Survey of Canada. I have a friend there, Dr. Roger Pollan, who is a numismatist. <coughs> and what I found was that for all of the identifiable types, the results that I was getting by XRF were seriously at variance to the figures that were published by Maheshwari. Um, and in general, I found that XRF gave me uh, <coughs> results that were significantly higher than the AAS. So what was the problem? Um, Roger Pollan suggested that perhaps it was due to the non-homogeneous uh, nature of medieval alloys. He thought they might have been highly granular and that this would throw off the results. Um, to test whether this was so, I took about 20 of these coins and cut them down the middle and took them back and did the outside and the inside of the same coin so there would be absolutely no uncertainty around the accuracy or the reason for what was going on. So here, for example, is one of uh, Maheshwari's uh, famous types. This is Sri Ha. It has a Ha on the front. Um, when we looked at the outside of the coin, it was about 18% silver. Um, for the internal slice, and you see there's actually a little bit of the, uh, the outside uh, relief there, but I was careful to choose a, a, uh, some spots away from that. <laughs> It was 15%. Not a significant difference. There, there is a difference there, but it's not something you would consider to be a, a major error. <coughs> Let's look at a few more. Uh, it was mentioned the Adivaraha, well, the Gujarat Pratyahara coinage uh, were uh, Adivaraha coins. Um, this was found by external XRF to be quite high, 82% silver. When we slice it open, the core was 48% so an immense difference between the surface and the interior. When we got into the Indo-Sasanian series, you can recognize these as one of the later ones on the continuum that I showed, but uh, quite a high silver content on the surface, 78%. When we sliced it open, only 36% on the interior. Same point. And we did a number of scans. The very, very late ones that everybody assumes are uh, almost copper, uh, surprisingly 78% on the outside. It made me wonder whether it had been plated. No, in the interior, it's consistent with the other ones. We're seeing the same pattern. Uh, this was not all copper, it was 35% <coughs> silver. But you're seeing a pattern here between the interior and the exterior. Generally, of the 20 I have, and let's recognize this is a very small sample. So we would have to do many more to have any statistical certainty about it. When the silver on the exterior was above 90%, the exterior interior was very close. So that the good silver coins, it didn't matter whether you're looking at the surface or the interior, they, they came out the same. When you got below 20%, as, and I showed you one of those, 
pretty well the same. It didn't matter a lot if you're looking at the exterior of the interior. They seem to be fairly homogeneous with a 5 or 10% difference between them. The difference between 17% and 15.5%. However, in that zone between, between 20% silver content and 90% silver content, and I'm, I'm going very roughly here because it was a small sample, there's a huge difference between the surface silver and the interior silver. I asked Midler just why this is so, and my advisor is uh, Dr. Nicholas Senior, Rob Senior's son, who happens to be in Canada and uh, is a material scientist in, in Halifax with the federal government. And he says, and, and, and forgive me for whom the, uh, for people in the audience for whom this is an obvious thing, silver and, and copper don't mix. They don't alloy like that. Although we've been using for thousands of years together in coins, they're amongst a few metals that when you mix them together, they don't go homogeneous. They don't like each other. And basically the copper sits in suspension in the silver. So here is a, one particular example, 80% uh, silver. You have what is the chemists call a eutectic mixture of 72% silver forming the matrix and great big blobs of high silver content floating within it. If we look at the opposite end of the spectrum, where it's a low silver content, you get just the inverse. <coughs> You've got exactly the same matrix, silver-copper matrix, but this time it has large blobs of copper sitting in it. Um, these, of course, are grains in, in its suspension, and they're, they're created in the process of casting. When you take a molten alloy and you cast it out the uh, silver and the gold apparently uh, crystallizes at, at different temperatures and therefore you, you get this formation. What does that mean for coins? Well, one of the surprising findings that's been around for 50 years, this was announced by Cope in a big metallurgical volume that the RNS uh, presented, uh, the silver always predominates. And interestingly, when Coins are struck from uh, um, uh, an alloy. When coins are struck from an alloy that was allowed to cool and then uh, rolled out and cut into blanks, there always is a silver surface. Inevitably, regardless of how you try to do it, um, the blanks will always have a silver surface, regardless of the percentage of silver or copper in them something I was totally unaware of. So this is not due to uh, an, an enrichment in the soil where the copper is leached out. It's not due to preferential cleaning techniques by uh, modern dealers who might be trying to hydrate the coins. It's a natural phenomena of the minting process. That's as far as I took this. I don't know where this goes. One of the things that strikes me is I have to know a lot more about ancient and medieval minting processes and see if any of this is reflected in the literature about it. I'm starting to wonder if looking back on that wonderful Sasanian series where the uh, percentage of silver was over 90% for three centuries, whether thin coins don't mean you're always going to get a trustworthy uh, asset because a, a thin, a super thin coin like the Sasanian is all surface, it's all surface effect. And I'm wondering if that wasn't done on purpose to give the users confidence that what they were seeing was what they were getting. Just throwing <coughs> it out there. And of course the other thing that probably has to be done, we have to go back and look at the AAS testing that was done by uh, people like Mr. Maheshwari. Is it possible that the surface enrichment is only on the top and bottom of a rolled out um, alloy and the edges are more high copper and that's what he was testing so he was not getting a fair uh, sense of what was inside. Don't know, um, these are the results I've got to date and I throw them out there uh, for consideration of our members. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Did you compare <coughs> the uh, results from the interior, when, once you cut the coin, 
with uh, Maheshwari's result? Um, I prepared tables, but I, I, I don't have good comparison, no. Uh, as I said, in any, any given type, his, um, his results are surprisingly all over the map. Uh, certain types that I showed you, uh, according to him, went from 5% to 80% solar. So I, I, I just, it, it, we're going to have to go, he's going to have to take us back to his original notes and see what he's done. Okay, more questions? Yeah, gentlemen, yes. to totally ignorant of all of this. Um, what is the pattern of weight changes over time? The um, metrology is surprisingly robust, and what happened was that actually, as the coins got narrow and thick, the weight went up. So in essence, it's possible that the quantity of silver stayed the same. In terms of net silver content? Yes. This is possible. In, in fact, that's always a quandary what have when the, uh, when the when when the silver content goes down and the weight goes up, is it is a way of selling a change. Well, but not not that it's going from ninety to twenty percent. That happened over a long period of time. But, yeah. I'm just raising a question. I don't have the answers at all. Sasha, well, uh, <clears throat> there was a very mm, extensive study done. Uh, well. For one, it's exactly what, what you did with this, it's exactly what I did with Bukhar mm -hmm. And uh, when I asked um, people in Oxford uh, to do, because these coins, Bukhar uh, coins, for example, they have radio cracks. So what we did, we went into radio cracks yes. and took a slash there. And that helped a lot without damaging coin, basically, because they're so small that they're not invisible. So, uh, as a result, we could do a fairly nice sample. Uh, but for, for years, we had this problem with Bukhar Khuda coins because they actually have the silver enrichment technology uh, increasingly um, to the ninth century, applied to the state that eventually um, they had practically no silver in the coins. And what is remarkable about it, that they even had an explanation, an explanation which actually matches what Jerry was saying. Because what they did, they came up with a presumable, uh, it's in Tariki Bukhara, you should look at the chat, uh, with presumable um, composition out of six elements. But if you look at these six elements, uh, they say that there was silver, gold, copper, lead, something else. One is undecipherable, something. Well, something Richard fun. Fry wrote on that. Yes. Right, right. And, and actually, there's a big thing which was written on this by David Deutsch. Uh, it's in Russian, but I, certainly I did the English translation a long time ago, and I can share it with you. It's about 70-page paper. So I, I, on the metal. I don't imagine for a moment that skilled mentors were unaware of this phenomenon. It must have been the basis of their art uh, that they would pass on from one to the other. So the whole question of medieval debasements takes on a new view if you know if if you figure that regardless of the silver content, the mingers can make it look silver uh, through their metallurgical processes. <coughs> it, it it kind of makes you think differently about what we're seeing. So uh, what I'm saying, I just uh, wanted to uh, so actually what Jerry suggested. At least they tried to fake it, right? In other words, they were claiming that there is enough silver. They're claiming that there's enough gold to cover the price, right? Right. And then there is a second thing. There is a book uh, by three authors. Is midday market? Who you probably know? Uh, it's uh, Koifman and uh, uh, Lebedev on Shadowmid coinage, where hundreds of analysis was taken because. Uh, Lebedev is actually a doctor of chemistry and uh, all his life he was acting, so he did very precise analysis and uh, it is in Russian. But once more, a long time ago translated into English, <laughs> it was still published as anything I did. <laughs> right? So, well, I'm ready to share it if you, if you need it. Because it's about 110 pages, it explains the whole phenomenon of civil crisis. 
Because what they were doing, they faking coins, sometimes up to three times a year, changing silver content. And as a result, the coins had only local circulation because nobody trusted them outside of the narrow area. Yeah. And that finally led to a civil, so-called civil crisis. Mm -hmm. But it's a very interesting study. So anyway, uh, it's wonderful that um, the Sindesasanian coins are quite remarkable. <coughs> Please, Michael. Yes, may I, I thought that was a very nice paper with some new things in it that uh, kind of surprised me. But I, I think also everybody, we all ought to think about and warn ourselves against taking all of this too seriously in terms of the metal content establishing somehow the value of the coin. All of these coins that you have shown us, if, you're, if your captions are correct, were dhammas. How much is this coin worth? One dhamma. Oh, what's a dhamma? This coin. Yes. And that's all there is to it. Now, that, that what Adama was, what it would buy in the marketplace, was totally variable. If you take your coins from the city, you're buying eggs, you're going to get one egg for Adama. You go to the country, you might get three eggs for Adama. That's just a fact of life throughout world human nature, human culture. You go from one city to the next, prices will be different. You look at the harvest time and the time before the harvest when the rain hasn't come and prices will be different. So the value of the coin is always a dama. It doesn't matter how much silver or copper there is going to be in it. No but, one calculates some kind of an imaginary value on that basis. They say, how much do you want for your wheat? And he says, 30 damas a bushel or 20 or 40, whatever it may be. I, I, I tried to stay away from the whole question of the value and the denomination. It was strictly a question of you using it as a sequencing tool. You did indeed, but I just wanted to remind people of this that they, that, you know, it's not exactly that people may in fact know how much silver and copper, but they're not sitting there and making a calculation based on so much silver at so much per silver and so much copper at so much per grain, and you put them together and you come up with a number. No, it's a dama. Right. And it's worth a dama. And a dama is worth whatever it will buy. And that's the long and short of it. Yes. So oh these God. changes may have saved money, perhaps for somebody at some time, but in little marginal uh, 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 intervals. Mr. Kulkarni, very good paper as always you do. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. One, yes. when you took the um, samples of silver from the cut coin. Yes. Did you take one sample or you took like 10 samples from different four positions and we, we, uh, did an average of it? We, we did uh, four to five. If, four, if, four, if the four, first two uh, varied, we would do a third. If that varied, we did a fourth. Yeah. Five was the maximum we did. But often we found it was spot on uh, first time for both of them. If we did a second one, it was exactly so the what same. What was the variance in different places in the coin? I mean, it was like too much or it was not? Quite. In the interior, uh, not much at all. I have to tell you, it depends on what you're using. And um, there are narrow beam and broad beam XRF machines. The yeah. uh, Geological Survey of Canada using extremely wide beam, which basically samples itself by the width of the beam. And it also automatically takes uh, 20 different pulses and uh, averages them for any one spot. Oh. I found that when the work was done by Tata uh, for Mr. Maheshwari in Mumbai, they used an extremely narrow focus machine and every place they went on the coin had a wildly different reading. And so they took 20 and they averaged it. With the broad beam machine, we didn't find that. We found that it was quite satisfactory each time. So it depends on the equipment. And the second question is, uh, have you done a study or has anyone done, done a study about uh, linking this metal with the ore? Like some of the metal was just what it was coming from the mines, they just took it and made coins or they changed the metallic composition. Where from the silver was coming, do you know that? I remember uh, a study uh, of micro constituents on Western Chakrapa coins done some years ago in which they compared it to the Zawar silver of the Zawar silver mines. And uh, I, I can't remember what the results were, but I, I presume it's possible. Uh, the problem, of course, is the reminting factor washes out whatever pattern there might have been from 
uh, an original ore. So were the coins struck from freshly mined ore, or they struck from whatever stuff was available mm -hmm. on the market, which had been remelted 50 times in its lifetime? I mean, that's, that's a factor to consider. Sasha? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say uh, uh, to Michael that's because it's a question, very important, I think, question, is that, uh, of course, on the market, uh, things cost what they cost. You still can buy, uh, I was just uh, thinking about it, that um, um, in a Amish country, a dozen of eggs costs 11 cents or something like this. And uh, if you uh, bring it to New York and sell it in a natural store, uh, this becomes super natural, right? Something like yes. six bucks or seven bucks or eight bucks. So that's one th thing. But there is something that we shouldn't forget because there were professionals who were measuring it all the time. Money changes. And money changes knew the prices. I'm sorry? Money changes traced. Money changes on the markets were actually professionals who were tracing what was happening with the coins and who were tracing what was actually the silver content. And money changes <coughs> were to a large extent, uh, well, what we have now as a, you know, um, definers of the price, or exchange price of different things. Yeah. So. I'm not, I, 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 I'm, I was thinking of money, professional money changers, and when I say they knew, it was probably because they had a brother-in-law who worked in the Met, if indeed the money changer himself didn't, because they were closely linked. Money changers know how much silver and stuff there is, but it would be only, you can only have a price for the coinage in comparison to some other thing, whether it's another coin, or a commodity. So just raising or lower the, the, the copper does not necessarily change the value. It's a question actually of supply and demand. And if there's too much of the coinage in the marketplace and people don't want it and it's not useful, they'll try to sell it and the price will necessarily drop, whatever that price is registered with. If it becomes short and it's still useful and they want it, they'll try to buy it and of course the price will go up. <coughs> The, the price of the coin, it's hard to, you know, it gets confusing because the coin itself is supposed it's to be the determinant right. or measure of prices, but the coin also has a price in relation to other things. So so it's not, the, it, it has something to do with how much the coin will buy, but probably, I, I don't think we ought to get overemphasize it. Or, and also this percentage of profit that the mint makes is very hard to estimate. If, if they reduce the silver by 50%, does that increase the profit of the mint 50%? Well, of course not. It's some other proportion, and who knows, and how does it work anyway? And All right, thank you very much, John. Thank you. Um, <laughs>